That's right, today on HOA Ham, we're going to talk grounding and bonding. Well, this ought to be an easy subject to cover. Should only take a couple of minutes, right? Wrong. This is more complex and has more varied opinions than how many and what length of ground radials should I use for portable ham radio operations. We have different home constructions from region to region, and then we have different application of local building codes from state to state here in the USA. Add to that the variation of various geographical regions, countries, and we just add in more complexity. So this is not a one-stop shop of step one, step two, step three, but again, general principles that you should apply to having a safe operating functional shack that is grounded and bonded properly. If you think you have something useful to add to this conversation, then by all means, leave something in the comments below and leave links to take us all to sites that are professional, capable, and reliable so we can all benefit from them. I'll leave links to various ARRL pages that also have links to other websites of reputable and knowledgeable individuals that give a lot of information that you should review before you set up your shack. I'll specifically point out things in the description below that deal with things that I don't quite know how to deal with. I live in a homeowners association in a single family dwelling that I own, so I can do to this dwelling what I need to. I don't live in an apartment building. I don't live in a second floor. So I'll try to leave some links to things that address those particular challenges that you may have. Here in the US, the FCC requires every licensed TAM operator to do a full review of their shack and assure that they're operating in a safe environment. That's on you. Your local building department has building codes and will do inspections to assure that any modifications that you make to your home are to code. This is why I say it's up to you to do your research. And even though that document that I just showed you from Amazon Bonding and Grounding is considered the industry standard, I have read it cover to cover before I did any major improvements here at my shack, it has a diagram. This diagram is on the ARRL Facebook page and it's taken directly out of that book. Many of you have already seen these units are all bonded together and that's a no-no in ham shack bonding. So even the technical resources don't always get it exactly right. It's up to you to expose yourself to a lot of information from experts and make sure you get it right, you follow code, you listen to the FCC and you operate safely. Let's see if we can make some examples and show you how I did this at my shack. Let's provide a simple definition of our term so we understand what we're talking about between bonding and grounding. When we think about grounding, we think about our house electrical system and this ground rod that is associated with our electrical panel. When we talk about grounding for the shack, that also includes lightning protection and RF grounding. And RF grounding is typically going to happen by this secondary ground rod that's attached to all of the equipment. What is bonding? Well, bonding is tying this shack ground to the electrical house system ground. It's connecting the two together. That is bonding. Hard stop right now for all newer hams. Lightning protection. Really? Lightning protection? The only way you're gonna protect yourself from lightning is to not be touching your ham gear to be far away from it. Many hams unplug their ham gear and disconnect their antennas. I think that's probably the only way to protect your gear and you from lightning strikes. Don't operate your gear anytime there's an electrical storm, thunderstorm, any kind of storm nearby that could produce any type of lightning. These little gizmos right here are called lightning protection, lightning suppressors, but let's face it, in a direct lightning strike, there's nothing going to be protected there, at least not sufficient enough to protect my life and my equipment. So no operating anytime there is a risk anywhere near my QTH. We'll start on the inside of the shack and work our way outwards. Don't worry, we'll talk an awful lot more about that cable distribution box from MFJ. Let's cut a hole in our drywall so that we can slip through that hole our flat piece of copper that goes to the shack ground on the outside. This will go to a bus bar here on inside the shack and that's what you're going to see next. So I've taken this piece of flat copper rod, threaded a couple of studs through it, put some washers and wing nuts on. 
Then I'm putting a small plastic standoff on the back side of it so it protrudes away from the wall, screwing it into studs, and then we're going to attach from our shack anything that requires a ground. The easiest way to look at this is if the equipment has a ground lug on it, it wants to be grounded in your shack, and this is where it goes. Don't daisy chain your equipment. Take each one individually with a ground strap down to this ground bar. We've removed the drywall from the back side of this wall. This is in the garage, so it was real easy for me to get access to this. You can see that that flat copper strap is coming out of the shack, and then it just goes up to the top side of the opening, travels across horizontally, as I get close to the exterior wall and then it takes a hard right hand turn down and then exits the concrete block stucco wall and then goes into this single point utility box that I picked up from DX Engineering. DX Engineering, you're welcome for the free advertising. The flat copper strap comes through the concrete block stucco wall, which of course I had to pound a hole in that thing and you'll see that in a future episode. And then it terminates in this flat piece of metal that comes with this distribution box kit. In the top left hand corner, you'll see a heavy gauge copper wire that's attached to the flat piece of metal. And then that goes to the shack ground rod that you saw at the introduction of the video. Now let's talk about sinking a ground rod or a new ground rod somewhere on your property for the shack ground. Back to being responsible and following the laws that are in your local region that are enforced by building departments. It's a requirement that before you do anything to protect your life and the utilities that service your communities that you call 811 before you dig. And sinking a ground rod is just like digging. Don't do it without calling and having somebody come out and provide locations for all the utilities that are in the ground so that you can safely put your ground rod in an area where there are zero utilities at risk. Just last month, there was some work done on the backside of our block, and this is what it looks like when they come out and mark where all the utilities are located. Then you can safely do the work that you have planned. Now that we're ready to do our work safely, let's do it smart. Perhaps in my younger days, I would have been stupid enough to grab a sledgehammer and try to pound this thing into the ground. I'm getting a little older and the brain needs to be used a little bit more than the brawn these days. Even if you're younger and you have the energy, I'd recommend that you rent or borrow a demolition hammer and get yourself this attachment on the end of it, which is specifically for driving ground rods. I have soft soil here in the state of Florida. You've watched me push uh, ground spikes into the ground for my antennas and I still had a great deal of effort required to get this into the ground. Save yourself some energy, some sweat, and some soreness. Rent the tool, buy the extension, get it done easy. Where I live by code, I'm required to sink that ground rod completely underground. And not only that, I was placing it out in my yard where it would be run over by the lawnmower from the lawn service, etc. Be a trip hazard or safety hazard. This is where I needed to locate it based on all the other things around my area. This was about the only place I could go. It needed to be completely underground, and so that's what you see me doing here. The final job for this activity was to bond the shack ground rod to the house electrical system ground rod installed many years ago when this home was built. And that's what you see me doing in this video. This is the house ground rod that is associated with the breaker box that is just on the other side of the wall in the garage. And this is me bonding it to the shack ground rod, which I just pounded into the ground fairly easily with that demolition hammer. Perhaps you haven't convinced the XYL why you need to put a hole in the side of your house through your concrete block stucco wall or through your stick frame house with siding. Or maybe that just makes you a little queasy to go to that level of commitment. There's another way to accomplish the same thing and it would just be two pieces of equipment, so to speak, rather than this single point utility box that I've chosen to use that combines several activities. You would still need to install a secondary ground rod for your shack grounding, similar to what I've done. And then you would add one of these brackets from one of our favorite ham radio distributors. 
This allows you with this bracket to add the quote lightning suppression slash protection unquote. You still have to bond this to the house electrical system ground rod and then you also then have to take a heavy gauge uh, copper wire over to the next device that I'll talk to which is basically a window feed through. So these two items this copper ground rod with this copper plate and the lightning suppression protection attached at this plate then let you take your feed lines from your antennas go into this lightning protection device and then take a secondary piece of coax and go to a window feed through unit similar to this unit from MFJ and MFJ sells these in all shapes and sizes or I should say all kinds of port options. The one I'm going to show you here on screen is completely decked out. It has every option possible. So if you don't want to be putting holes in your walls, here is an option that you can do to give yourself the protection that you need and the proper grounding, etc. One final thought on bonding and grounding. Let's say you live in a rental property and you can't sink a ground rod. What do you do? Well, as I was figuring this all out for myself, I operated as though I was in a rental, even though I owned my property and could sink that ground rod. I operated backyard portable. So I had a way similar to this MFJ feed through panel to get coax into my home from my antenna. When I was ready to operate, I would go set up my antenna. When I was done operating, the antenna would come down. So it wasn't up in a permanent situation where I needed to be thinking about protection from electrical storms, etc. I operated hours at a time, set up antenna, take down the antenna, get the coax through with some feed through similar to this. That's how I treated my house and that's how potentially you could work with your rental home. You could put something like this and I'll leave links to the number of different MFJ options that you would have in the description below. There are several more episodes to this Ham Radio Shack build-out series, and I hope that the examples I provided are useful to you as you do your homework and set up your shack to operate safely. Have a blast, friend. Talk to you soon. 73.